native people still fish for salmon on the Skeena, although outboards and gill nets are now common. At traditional fishing sites like Morristown Canyon, Indians scramble over the same outcroppings as their ancestors to reap the silver harvest. Using gaffs and dip nets, the native fishery isn't as selective as it could be. Too many Chinook and steelhead are caught needlessly. Gaffing is a controversial technique that subjects many fish to abuse. Well, we've uh, done a lot of work on looking at the issue of gaffing in the Morristown Canyon and other canyons that we have on our territories. The, the one in Morristown is the most visible one, and what we're looking at is to try to get people from the different house groups to control the fishing sites and the fishing holes that are in the canyon, possibly looking at closing some of the fishing sites down, uh, particularly the ones where we know that the holes are being used to take certain species, particularly the, um, the Chinook and other species like coal or any other species that, uh, that we know that are weak, that uh, will close those holes down so that people won't be able to gas. The uh, Kiksa and Mutoran have um, made a decision to return to our traditional way of fishing, and that's to use the weirs and, and fish traps that we could do selective harvesting. And next year, we're going to test some more of those, those traps and those weirs. The objective with alternative technologies like this fish wheel is to facilitate sorting by species while the salmon are still alive. Strong stalks are kept, weak ones released. It's not a new idea. Through history, natives have employed selective techniques in salmon streams throughout the province. Using river seine nets and fish traps, they took all the fish they needed, and salmon stocks remained healthy. However, with the advent of the commercial industry on the coast, everything changed. Laws were passed banning the Indians' traditional methods, and they were given jobs on boats and in canneries. Today, natives have started using beach seines again for their in-river fisheries. In the 1920s, companies built efficient commercial fish traps at the mouth of the Skeena to intercept migrating salmon. However, the owners of canneries and net boats saw a threat to their control of the resource and had in-river traps banned. The age of the commercial fleet had begun. Today, salmon fishing is a high-stakes, capital-intensive game. A few big corporate players hold all the cards. When more than 15 million salmon are caught each season, many people can't understand why there's such a fuss about a few thousand steelhead. Steelhead is, uh, as it's often portrayed as a conservation problem, when in fact it's not. What we're dealing is with an allocation problem. The steelhead catches on the Skeena River by the commercial fleet have not changed over the last 25 years. This is according to DFO and provincial figures. What we're looking at is uh, changes in economies in the north coast whereby economies in the central interior are looking to develop sport fishing and, uh, opportunities and economic development based on force sports fishing. Pressure is therefore being put on the commercial fishing industry to release more steelhead to get upriver. Anglers, however, aren't just crying for a bigger piece of the pie. They're fighting to save a vanishing treasure. Although the annual catch of Skeena steelhead by the commercial fleet has been constant, the proportion this represents of the remaining fish has risen dangerously. The difference between intercepting one quarter and one half of a remnant wild population can be the difference between survival and extinction. Responding to public concern, DFO initiated an experimental steelhead rescue program in 1992 some gillnetters tried saving steelhead from their nets and passing them on to a rescue boat. Although about 400 fish were eventually released to continue up the Skeena, the token project was less of a conservation measure than it was a public relations effort. The first tag steelhead uh, released from the commercial fishery was caught 
just this week up in the Kitlunga area, about 100 miles upstream of the commercial fishery. This has shown us and encourages us that the program is a success and will work. Uh, trying to get them out of gill nets is a little unrealistic. Uh, a lot of the fish are going to be killed in a gill net, and uh, taking them out is not going to be the uh, not going to be easy on them in, in any event. So you really have to replace gill nets if you want to really cut back on the harvest of uh, incidental species like uh, steelhead or chinook or coho or whatever. For threatened salmonid populations on the Skeena, the status quo spells disaster. Their future depends on people's willingness to change. We've done all the adapting we could possibly do as sport fishermen, and um, the, the commercial fishery is just beginning. The Indian fishery seems to be cooperating. They seem to be uh, starting to use you know, traps and weirs, and, and that's the answer. The commercial fishery, in order to survive, has to change too. It has to make changes. The, that's the only permanent thing in the world, is change. And uh, unless you are prepared to do it, you're going to hurt somebody. At this point, uh, the commercial fleet has not uh, embraced uh, the concept of using more selective uh, uh, fishing technology. Uh, there's a great deal of concern on the part of the, fish, uh, the commercial fleet that they uh, would be uh, faced with uh, losing jobs, losing fishing opportunity if they went uh, that route. That's created uh, some more problems for us uh, to, in meeting our, uh, our commitment to the 50% reduction. We're going to have to seek ways of uh, meeting that within the uh, uh, context of the uh, existing fleet and uh, how we are going to alter their fishing patterns, uh, working with them to do that uh, in order to meet the 50% reduction. I've been writing about recreational fishing for 40 years. And in that time, I've seen the Department of Fisheries go from ignoring recreational fishermen or sportsmen to tolerating the sportsmen to holding them at bay. Now they're in a sort of a watchdog position where they seem to be hiring the PR directors and managers that are, that are yesing us to death, buttering us all up, but still not listening to our recommendations. By avoiding the tough decisions that have to be made, bureaucrats continue to play politics with the long-term survival of wild salmon and steelhead. Yet solutions aren't hard to find. If you really want to solve the problem, then you go at it like they did in the Soviet Union a few years ago, many years ago. They just put a weir across the river. You know, it was on the Kamchatka Peninsula. They just put a weir across the river, and all the fish have got to come through the weir, and that's it. You don't have any nets to worry about. You can select which ones you're going to harvest and which ones you're going to let go upstream. A selective terminal fishery could solve many problems. Instead of being caught in the ocean, where weak populations mingle with strong, target runs of salmon could be harvested according to their abundance, from tidewater to spawning areas. For commercial fishermen, a labor-intensive selective fishery could actually mean more jobs, more fish, and more revenue. And depleted runs of wild salmon and steelhead could be rebuilt and sustained forever. Wild steelhead are too precious to let slip away. The more we learn about the importance of biodiversity, the less acceptable extinction becomes. From the way we treat wild salmon stocks, we can discover much about our relationship to nature and the prospects for our own survival.